Well, thanks very much for inviting me here to Amsterdam. I'm all the way from Ireland, and I just got a text from one of the doctors we're working with. I think he's watching on some sort of live stream. And he, the message said, There's, there must be a joke in this. Irish man goes to Amsterdam and talks in a church. Da -da -da. <laughs> First. So I'm here to talk about predominantly sort of the, the work that we're doing in this space and how we think it relates to the wider market. Um, but I'm going to start with an introduction to my first appreciation that telecoms were going to be important in healthcare. I was about three, four years old, and I was there on visiting hours. My little brother was ill. And all I remember, my first memories of doctors, is they always jangled. They walked along the ward, and they always jangled. They had these big pockets, and at the bottom of them, there was heaps of cash. It was all 10p coins for the machine at the bottom of the ward where you could go and make a call. And it was very important to prefer these coins to families when you told them information, because they had no other way of organizing themselves. Who's doing the care? Who's going home? Where, how are we going to organize this family during this time? It was in a sick children's hospital, so it was really, um, obviously, sensitive issues with, you know, baby, baby's ill, and parents didn't want to leave, and other children might have been at home. So I, I realized straight away there was, a, there was a telecoms angle in it. Soon forward, 1995, and I'm enrolled in a medical school, and I'm the only person with a mobile phone. And everybody else is thinking, what has this guy got a mobile phone for? What does he need one of them? Um, and I, I didn't have the resources for one, nor did I have the need for it. But I'd convinced my brother, who's a vet, that he needed one during his out-of-hours hours. So he basically needed it about three nights a week. All the rest of the time, I had the mobile phone. Quite cunning, I guess. But um, it meant I had a very early start playing around with these things. Um, and that was, the, that was the phone that I had. So moving on, I got this idea while I was at medical school that there's got to be some opportunity in these smartphones that are coming along. We're going to be able to, you know, or I think most of us realize that this isn't a phone anymore. This is a sensor, and it's on the end of our arm all the time, every day, always on, pretty unique to us. We're not sharing it with other people. And in that, there's an immense opportunity for holding the most important information we all already own, but none of us are carrying, our health record. I always carry mine, have done since we launched this company in 2006. It basically means it's always there, available if a paramedic or someone that needs to attend me. But also, with our service, it allows us to share it remotely. So I can just call somebody up who knows who I am, but they don't know who I am, because they're looking at my health information while I'm talking to them. We use simple corner ID for that. So we saw this opportunity for using a mobile, but also you know, a, a back-end web-based service, and uh, went and told some people, and this is what the uh, mobile operators did. Big laughter when we said, this is a great idea. You're launching this 3G network. You've spent these billions. We'll, we'll launch this with you. So the reason why they laughed is they said, look, I could probably see an angle in the developing world where they don't have hospitals and they don't have primary care. All these ideas you're saying might be important there because, you know, uh, they don't have anything, so we give us, but no one in Africa is going to want a mobile phone. You know, that's been proven wrong. We've got village phones all over the world now. Patients, they won't ever learn how to use this. Seniors, forget them. I think we all know since the iPhones come out and made picture messaging really popular among seniors. In America, we've got the iPhone. So even things like picture messaging, which people thought, this is a patient station. This is where it looks like some sort of fruit machine or a cigarette vending machine. It's positioned in hospitals, and you buy coupons for expensive calling tariffs, which you give to your, 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 you know, your friend who's, who's, in, who's in the hospital. And the funny thing about this is it charges premium rate for people to call you. So the hospital, when they did the deal with the patient station company, they said, tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll put the, the, the units in free of charge as long as you put notices all around the hospital saying mobile phones banned. So they banned all the mobiles, and people had to ring their patient on a premium rate number. Highly unethical, uh, really horrible what it was doing was in, dis in disrupting the, the extended care community. The people who aren't paid carers, the people who just phone up and check his mummy all right when she's in, um, staying in. The mobile operators also said, I think you've actually got it all wrong. 3G doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, 3G means games, gambling, and girls. And this slideshow shows you that all sort of wrapped up in one. Um, they also said M helps a niche, and I thought this was so funny, because this, like I say, is the most important information each one of us has got. There's no niche in it. Um, got some more laughter, though, because when we convinced mobile operators that some of this could be done, we told the medical people, and it was raucous laughter at that, that stage. Um, they were carrying these devices, so me explaining that augmented reality and stuff like this just didn't go down well. I've got a perfectly good page. It bings all the right times and everything. 
They also couldn't understand that I'm talking about computing power on this, and now I've got a device in my hand which is more powerful than the one that they used to send a probe to the moon. So and I've also got another one in my back pocket which um, networks with that one. So I think there's an enormous opportunity there. Um, they also said patients aren't going to pay for this. We've got our paying processes. You'll disrupt that, or um, who's going to buy a phone? It's really expensive. So there are loads of issues, and then you hit the regulatory. And we had to, before we allowed GPs to do this, we had to get them insured. GPs in the UK and Ireland are self-regulating with their medical bodies. So we had to go to the medical bodies and say, look, can we do this service? We had to talk to the insurers and say, can we do video conferencing with patients that we don't know? The insurer said, this is ridiculous. I cannot believe you could even think that you're going to get this. Nobody anywhere in GP practice was allowed to use video conferencing with their patients on their normal rates. So that includes those great big, you know, beautiful Tambergs and Polycom units. You're not allowed to do it. And the reason why is because they don't have the ability to offer continuity care. They don't have, what happens if the patient walks off or turns his computer off and stuff like this? Um, and you don't have their history. So we built technologies that solve that problem um, and the continuity care, and they were satisfied. And we, get, we got this approved for normal GP rates. So a GP can sit in his